Hello, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. And it's my pleasure to be down here uh, at this group. This is uh, it's one of my favorite groups in New Jersey. Um, I don't get down here enough. The, the, uh, the, tr the trip is a little onerous, um, but it's always worth it when, when I get down here. I, uh, I remember doing a, a long workshop with David Palmer. Remember, I, I thought that would never end. And that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, so, so everybody that's a part of this meeting, um, you know, the, uh, they, they have my, my respect, and I, I really believe that it's a pocket of enthusiasm. Um, not every meeting you go to is focused on the same things. The, this meeting is focused on it. And, uh, I particularly, my, my preference is uh, is meetings that focus on on the solution, and uh, this is certainly one of them. So, so tonight I'm supposed to speak on the chapter working with others. Um, nothing will so much ensure immunity from alcohol as intensive work with other alcoholics. That's the first line in this chapter and and you know i just want to talk on that line a little bit think about immunity um think about having having an, an immune system illness because some of those uh have become prevalent in the last 30 or 40 years um, what happens when your immune system is compromised you you can you can get sick and normal germs and normal things that wouldn't wouldn't really normally hurt you can now kill you because your immune system is is shot so working with other people is the thing that contributes to a healthy immune system from alcohol and i'm i'm certainly someone who if you're working with me and you're consistent with meetings and you're starting to move through the steps, I'm gonna encourage you to work with other people. And I don't care if you have a year or a month or a week. If you're a certain way through the steps and there's a certain determination you have, I'm not gonna cut you off from the immunity. And the, immu the immunity comes with working, working with others. Um, so here's my experience with working with others and with this chapter. <clears throat> when I got sober, it was 1989. I got sober in the Morristown, New Jersey area. And I got myself a sponsor. And he, you know, he was a good sponsor for that period of time. This guy was one of the best. He certainly had what I wanted. He had a great family life. You know, he was compassionate. He did a lot of service work. He was a good father. He had a good job. You know, all the things that I would have seen from the outside that, you know, yeah, that, that's really what I want. You know, I'm living at home with mom, you know, wearing clothes that I bought 25 years ago. So, yeah, I would, you know, there's this, I want to, I, I want to work toward what this guy represents. And I got him as a sponsor. And what was, what was normal back in those days was, a fellowship sponsor was what you would normally get. Somebody that would say, somebody would say, Steve, you know, I'll, I'll sponsor you. Okay, uh, I'll, I want to see you at meetings. And here's my phone number. Give me a call if you get in trouble, and I want to see you at meetings. And, and that was kind of normal, right? Uh, a fellowship-type sponsor. If you got a good sponsor, you'd get somebody who had some service background. So... He not only would want you to be consistent with meetings and expect you to show up at a home group and all that, but he would encourage you to do service commitments. Anything from making coffee to be in the GSR. I mean, there's a, there's a, a plethora of, uh, of different things that, that they would push you to do. So my sponsor was one of those exceptional sponsors who also encouraged me to do service work. Um, what was what was lacking, at least in our area, at least in what I what I saw back then, my my experience in the rooms, was a three legacy sponsor, someone who understood the recovery process. 
I remember when I was finally told to go do a four-step, um, I was told to go do a four-step. And I kind of assumed that it, it really sounded like he expected me to know how to do a four-step, and I didn't want to look stupid, so I just walked off expecting to do a four-step. So, so I didn't know much about it. Uh, so I went to every four-step 12 and 12 meeting I could find. There was like six 12 and 12 meetings in my area. So I timed them all so that I would get to all the four-step meetings. And, all, and folks, all that did was confuse me. So, so what I ended up doing, what I ended up doing when I did my first four-step was a life story, which is basically what I learned in treatment, which is really a first-step prep is what a life story is. It's not a four step. It's a, you're not discovering any chunks of truth about yourself. You know, if you wrote it, you already know all of it. You know, there's no discovery to it. You're, you're cataloging it. But that's what I did. I cataloged the, the monstrous dysfunctional life I had had up to that point. And I put some, you know, dirty, rotten little secrets in there and some, you know, some, th- some, uh, some things that I saw that, that, that were recurring, you know, like, like <laughs> themes of failure in my life. And that really was my fifth step. And I went off and I did my fifth step and my, and my, my sponsor had no, no real, real issue with that. Now, on, around 1990, late 90, uh, early 90, 1991, somebody gave me a set of cassette tapes and they were the late, great Joe and Charlie. <clears throat> and and what I did was I, I listened to these tapes and, and they, they really did upset me because, because they were talking a language I was, I did not have the vocabulary for this language. They were talking about working a program of recovery by following the instructions in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And this is not, at least the meetings I was going to, this, this was not an orthodox, or, uh, uh, or well-documented way of doing any of that stuff. So, so when I went through these tapes, I got, I got upset uh, because, because if these tapes were right, everybody in all my meetings were wrong and my sponsor was wrong. And that would have been a real difficult pill to swallow. You know, I, I, was, I believed that my life was being saved by the meetings and by my sponsor. And by listening to the Joe and Charlie, they went so at odds with what I knew about AA and what was being shared in the discussion meetings and all that, that, that I, pushed it, I pushed it away. And, and maybe that's how they do it in Arkansas, but in New Jersey, we share. You know what I mean? That's how we stay sober. We share. Now, some things happened in my life. Uh, I went through uh, a couple of jackpots. Um, and the, um, the emotional, hideous four horsemen were on me. You know what I mean? Like the pitiful and the incomprehensible. I, I was so depressed. And I had such anxiety. And I had such shame. Uh, and it all boiled up. It, it wants that what happened was um, I, I believe the grace of God. I believe the grace of God is out there. It's available to all of us. Every once in a while, one of us wakes up enough to capture some of that sunlight of the spirit, to walk out into the sun and capture some of that sunlight of the spirit. And, and I think I think I did that at this point in time. And instead of going crazy, committing suicide, relapsing or whatever, because I couldn't I couldn't go one more day feeling the way I was feeling. I picked up these tapes and I started to, I started to go through the 12 steps. So, so I had a step experience. I, you know, I'm not saying I did a great job with the steps. I, I did them listening to a tape, trying to figure out the big book. And, and, but I did, it in, I did inventories. I, I shared those inventories. I put a men's list together. I did the amends. I started a prayer and meditation thing every morning and every night. And, and, uh, and so I, I, I started to get some experience with the recovery process. And, and what was really happening to me was my, my spirit was healing. Um, 
We come in here with such damaged spirits. We're, you know, we're in more trouble than we think we are, and we're hurt more than we think we are when we get in here. We, you know, we've been covering up and acting as if and you know, stiff upper lip uh, for so long. Uh, but what happened is, is I started to heal and I, st- I started to, to recover. And I, and I had a bunch of sponsees by this time because I was learning to give good share. I mean, I had some step experience now. I'd been, I was going to 12, 13 meetings a, a, a week. I'd been sober a couple of years now. And, you know, I learned how to, you know, make everybody like me by, like, sharing, you know, just a little, you know, a, a little bit self-deprecating, you know, talking about a little, little stupid thing that I did today, ha, 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 you know. And, 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 and so I was getting sponsees. And... And so as I was getting these sponsees, I was doing what my sponsor did with me. Now, understand I had a step experience at this time, but I was hearing things like you got to give it away the way you got it. I mean, there was one-liners galore in, in, the, in, in, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. And, and people that said that meant that. You can't give away something you don't have. You don't, you don't give away, you don't give it away the, unless you got it that way. And so... So when Steve would come up and ask me to sponsor him, I'd give him my phone number and I'd say, I expect you at some meetings. I want to see you at some meetings. And uh, so I had maybe a dozen guys and, and a lot of them were drinking on me. You ever have somebody drink on you and make you look bad? <laughs> These guys were drinking on me. And, you know, somebody would come up, hey, is Harry yours? You know, you know, he's hitting on women and borrowing money and, you know, yeah, Harry's mine. You know, I'll, I'll talk to him. So one day I come, to, I, I, I just, I decide to do this. I, I remember I'm living in Pottersville, New Jersey at this time. Uh, uh, my wife and I had just bought a little cottage on the river. It was a cool little idyllic place. And uh, you, could, you could walk out the front door and you'd be right there by the Black River and, and I, started to, I started to bring people over my house and do the Joe and Charlie. Th- and by this time, I discovered Joe Hawk tapes, right? There's some Joe Hawk tapes that were mind-blowing for me, the Salvation Army tapes. I discovered those. And so what I do is now when Steve would ask me to sponsor him, I would say, okay, what you need to do is you need to be at my house Thursday, Thursday nights, Tuesdays and Thursday nights, you know, you're coming over to my house, be there at seven o'clock. And, and, and he would come over. And what we would do is we would open this book to the title page and go through, at least through the chapter working with others, line by line, paragraph by paragraph. And when there was an instruction, we'd get really, really clear on the instruction and we would actually take the instruction. Now, everybody that that I asked over to my house to do this. They didn't all make it, you know. Some of them pooped out in the fourth and fifth step. Some of them came to the conclusion that the, uh, the amends was kind of an overreaction to a problem they really had under control now because their therapist said so or some other goddamn thing. And, and so, th- so they, would, they would disappear. But, but the people that locked in and stayed and, and did the work out of this book, this was the early 90s. I know where every one of those guys is. They're all still sober. I know where every one of them is. They're card-carrying members of AA in good standing, working with other people. And, and it, it's, it's an experience. It's a lesson that I learned through experience. Now, the, the funny thing is, is everything that I basically just shared, it tells us to do in the chapter we're going to go over tonight. It tells us that our job is to take somebody through the steps. Our job is not to, you know, say, hey, I want to see you at 12 meetings a week and call me when, you know, when your life blows up. And I'll, and I'll help. I'll be the drama coach. You know, I'll, I'll help you try to manage a life that you're supposed to be admitting is unmanageable anyway. And, uh, and so, so, um, so really, what, you know, what it, what it says in this chapter is basically what I ended up starting to do. Um, 
imperfectly though it must have been. So here's a little reading from, uh, this, this is, Bill W. wrote this. It's a, it's a tiny little pamphlet, Problems Other Than Alcohol. It says, sobriety, freedom from alcohol through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps is the sole purpose of an AA group. Sole pur- so the teaching and the practice of the 12 steps is the sole purpose of an AA group. Not in 89 it wasn't. <laughs> Not in the early 90s it wasn't. Uh, what had happened was there were outside influences. You could not shake a stick without hitting a treatment center in, in, the, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, they'd open the door. You could shake a dead chicken over somebody's head and, and get reimbursement from the insurance for it. It, it, was, it, was, it was the Wild West, and there was a treatment center everywhere. And part of the issue was... They were, treatment is, it talks about, you know, behavioral, therapeutic kind of things. And that's appropriate in treatment. That's appropriate if you're, if you're looking at a mental health model and a psychiatric model and all that. But what would happen is the people who had 28 days of this started coming into AA by the horde. And all of a sudden, the most popular meeting around is a discussion meeting where everybody sits in a circle and talks about their day and talks about their problems. The the sole purpose of an AA group is the teaching and practice of the 12 steps. Uh, And the ball was dropped. I really think the ball was dropped. Now, groups groups like this focus on the solution. They focus on the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and they focus on... Let's get back to some basics. Let's get back to the stuff that really works. That really works. That, that, let's get to back to the stuff that's Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and I, think one, I think one of the most underutilized chapters in our book is the chapter working with others. When I first read this, I thought, oh, my God, those hardcore People back in the late 30s, oh my God, you know, today, today, we're, we're much more compassionate. We're much more understand. They had better outcomes in 1938 than we do today because they did this stuff. They had better outcomes. More people stayed sober when they were hardcore like this, when... It basically says in this chapter, if someone is not willing to go through the steps with you, you may have to drop them. You may have to drop them, let them hit another bottom, and maybe, hopefully, they'll come back, and the next time they come back, they'll be willing to go through the steps. There's instructions like that in this. I saw this as really hardcore. You know, that's not the way our groups were handling things. It's not the way the sponsors were handling things when I got sober. I believe today this is the most compassionate way. This is the most compassionate way to hold somebody. If if you're coming to me and asking for sponsorship, I think the most compassionate thing is to hold your feet to the fire, to do this recovery work. Because rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly done this. Not thoroughly gone to meetings, not thoroughly had service commitments. You get thoroughly done this work. So I'm going to start reading and, and shut up here. Uh, practical experience shows nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. Not your message, this message, the, the, the message that's in this book. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. I, be, I truly believe in signals for purpose. I believe an alcoholic sitting across from another alcoholic can get through to that person like no one else can. And I, I believe a heroin addict sitting across the table from a heroin addict can get through to that heroin addict like no other person can. I believe in singleness of, of purpose. I believe in we work with the people who have the common problem and then we offer them the common solution.
It goes right into some promises. Life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. Um, frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. That's true for me. That's a promise that's true for me. Uh, I, have, I have about six new guys now who are somewhere in the process of, of the steps. Basically, how I sponsor is, is how it's kind of laid out in this book. Um, I, we'll meet at my house. We'll, we'll do step one or we'll do step one, two, and three in the first meeting. It'll, it depends on how much experience the person has, how much they, how much they get, how much they, they, they get out of this. Uh, I'll send them away with four-step forms. They'll have my phone number if they have any questions about how to write inventory. Uh, I'm going to be available. Um, the next time we meet, they'll be coming with their, with their four-step forms, and we're going to do a fifth step. Uh, after the fifth step, I'll explain how to do returning home, how to do six, seven, eight, and nine. And the next time we meet, they'll come with their amends cards, and we will gain consensus on amends. What are those amends going to look like? In the meantime, I'll be having them read 10 and 11 every single day out of the book Alcoholics Anonymous because that's really the spiritual growth part of the program. And then after they're out there making amends, I keep track of them. I make sure that they're they're going to complete as many of them as they can possibly complete. And from that point on, they're, they're God-directed. They're, they're, they can always call me, and, and we can even become friends. But what happens is you gain access to an inner power. And you gain access to guidance and direction and a conscious and the consciousness of the presence of God is going to be operating within you. And you're not going to need to be babysat anymore. And as long as you're digging deeply into 10 and 11, you're going to be growing spiritually and you're going to be maintaining your spiritual condition. Uh, I stay in contact with most of the people that I sponsor, but there's a lot of people that just go through the steps with me and they're gone. I don't have uh, ownership. I don't have authority. I don't have, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't, I, you know, I have no, um, no sense of property about people. What, what I, uh, what, what I believe very much in is I can show people the simple kit of spiritual tools that leads to an awakened spirit. And with that awakened spirit, they take that spirit back out into AA, out into the world, into their family, into their jobs, and, and start, living, start living life. And, uh, you know, I, where did I get all this? Uh, I, I got it because of a very, very serious amount of study with this particular book, which is the book Alcoholics Anonymous. It's our basic text. So it says, maybe you're not acquainted with any drinkers who want to recover. Then it gives a paragraph or two about how do you find, okay, you've gone through the steps. You're working 10, 11, and 12. You've made your amends. Now it's time to start working with other people. Where are you going to find other people to work with? This book, there was only two AA meetings when this book was, was and they weren't even really called AA meetings yet. There were two groups, and they understood that this book was going to be sent all over the place, and there's going to have to be instructions in here about how to do all these steps. So they tell you where you can find drunks. You can find them uh, in, in mental asylums. You can find them at court. You can find them at in, in hospitals. Ask some doctors. Ask some priests. Go, go out and find some alcoholics to work with. That's your job now. And, uh, and today, today things, are, things are a lot easier. For the most part, the alcoholics come to us. 
They show up in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And, and don't ever think that there's not still sick and suffering alcoholics in our rooms who've been here for years, sometimes decades, who have not done these steps so, that, so they have not recovered and they do not have healed, awakened spirits. There are people that can be helped. But there's still opportunities to do 12-step calls. I did one yesterday. And I, I want to I share a little bit about this. I like hospital calls. I'm a big fan of the hospital 12-step call. Why? Because they're in their jammies and they, and they ain't going nowhere. <laughs> That's why. And, and if I want to sit there and I want to talk, I can sit there and talk. And uh, so I get a call. I get a call from somebody, uh, my, you know, my... Uh, my stepbrother, or uh, my, uh, my brother-in-law is, you know, almost died, you know, uh, passed out in the tub, almost bled out, you know, he's got, got progressive heart failure, all this stuff, uh, and, and he was in ICU for like six days. That's us. We drink ourselves into ICU for six days. And, for, and you know, I know enough not to go into ICU, so the minute he gets, he gets cut loose from ICU, uh, I show up at his bedside. Now he's, he's unconscious, and I'm like, crap. <laughs> I, you know, should I wake him up? Should I wait? So I wait about a half an hour, and then I see him move a little. So I kind of like shake the bed, and, uh, and he comes to, and, and I start talking to him. And I start talking to him about my drinking. I start talking to him about when I was in Morristown Memorial Hospital for my alcoholism. And I started to talk about the things that I know he could connect with, the loneliness, the isolation. He was living in a basement of some relative that would, you know, he's lost his family, lost his job, lost his, you know how we are. And he's alone by himself drinking giant plastic bottles of vodka. You know, that's where we end up. And, uh, and so I start to talk about my bottom and where I was at uh, and how, how, lonely things were for me. Then I started to talk to him about the, the emotional pain, about the shame, about the guilt and remorse for letting everybody down and doing the crap that we do. And I, start, I started to get him to talk and he started talking. Um, it took about a half an hour until this guy said, would you please would you please help me get into Alcoholics Anonymous? And, uh, and I, said, I said, well, first, you know, you're, you're, go, you're, you're off to the Betty because uh, we favor hospitalization for the Bafog. He needs some treatment. You know, I don't even know if he can walk yet, but he's detoxed. He needs some treatment, some stabilization. And, uh, and I said, the minute that's over, I, you know, I want a phone call. And... And it may not be me, but, you know, the boys are going to show up at your house. And, uh, and one of them's going to start working with you. And one of them's, you know, and the rest of them are going to be starting to take you to meetings and get you involved in the, the fellowship. But um, that's, that's what, what, what we're, we're, we're supposed to, to do. I don't believe anymore that abstinence and meeting attendance is a treatment for alcoholism. I don't believe that's true anymore. I've seen too many people go to a lot of meetings and drink, and I've seen too many people not drinking drink. What I don't see as much is the people who take their 12-step recovery program seriously and do the inventory and do the fifth step and go out and actually make the amends, actually pay the money back, actually go, I'm here to make amends. I don't see those people drinking. I, I see them year after year after year stick around. And, uh, and this book ex explains exactly, when you discover a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous, find out all you can about them. I talked to the family on the way to the hospital. I wanna know as much as I can about the individual. If he does not wanna stop drinking, don't waste time. Uh, these are all instructions. If there's any indication he wants to stop, have a good talk with the person uh, most interested in him. Sometimes it's wise to wait till they go on a binge. 
I mean, I'm not going to read all this stuff, but these are all instructions. This is how we're supposed to do our job. These are marching orders. Um, if he does not want to see you, don't force yourself on him. Um, see your man alone if possible. That does not mean go on a 12-step call by yourself. It means don't, don't try to identify with the individual like Talk about your drinking and have them talk about their drinking in front of the family. The family's usually really pissed. Um, when he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Tell him how baffled you were, how you finally learned that you were sick. This is, this is what I did with the guy yesterday. If you're satisfied he's a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. What's the hopeless feature of the malady? The obsession of the mind. That's part of step one. Part of step one is you have a brain that's going to take you back to alcohol every time. An unrecovered brain that's going to take you back to alcohol every time. How much power is powerless? That's what they're talking about. Uh, so what I talked about is I said, you've probably tried to quit. You know, I tried to quit a whole bunch of times. And you know what? I found that I changed my mind. Did you change your mind too? And he's like, yeah, I changed my mind. I go, that wasn't, you didn't have a mind to change is the thing. An obsession is a thought that overruns everything else. And I explain this to him and I go, you're not a bad person. You're not weak. You're not stupid. You're powerless. And, and you know, if you, it, did, did you really want to burn your life to the ground? No, you were, you were caught up in something that was bigger than you. But you are sitting in an opportunity right now. You're sitting in an opportunity to get with some people who found a solution to this. And we need you. We need you. Come with us. Come with us. Join us. Because we know where you are right now. We've been there. Join us because we need you. And let's... And let's do this Alcoholics Anonymous thing. Let's do this spiritual program of recovery. And he, and he, he literally can't wait. Continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness. Here, here's something I want to dwell on. Alcoholism as an illness, not a behavioral problem. It's not because we're assholes. It's not behavioral. It's an illness. So think about this. Think about cancer. Can, you, you know, it's not causal. What happens is it's an internal causality. It's a genetic causality. Whether, whether somebody will go through treatment for cancer and sometimes it'll come back and sometimes it won't. You know what I mean? The person that it comes back to, is that guy a loser? We don't think that way because we don't have any stigma as far as cancer is concerned. But we see the relapser. And we think, what a loser. Or the families do, right? Folks, let's look at this like it's an illness. And some people cannot or will not fully embrace the recovery process. They cannot or will not because maybe they don't believe it's going to work. Maybe they don't have the capacity. But as an, as an illness... I've worked very, very hard at, at, at reducing my personal stigma. Uh, and, and, I, and I think we all need to look at this. I've been a board member of the NCADD, which isn't far from here. It's over in Robbinsville uh, for 13 years now. It's the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, the New Jersey branch. Uh, it's run by a wonderful man, Wayne Werda. And, and, really, really well-meaning people that are out there trying to help people like us. They're trying to help. If, if, if you are on the balls of your ass and you get put into treatment, it's because somebody in the NCADD navigated you there. You know what I mean? These are, these are people who really, really care. And the NCADD was formed in like 1940 for the sole purpose to reduce the stigma to alcoholism and drug addiction. And you know how far they've gotten since like 1940? Like 10% maybe, you know? 
It's so deep rooted. It's so deep rooted. Uh, but when you're doing a 12 step call on, on somebody, talk about it as an illness. Look, you're not, you probably think you're such a scumbag, you know? You probably, how about, how about you were caught up in something that was much more powerful than you are? How about you were being driven into this because it's an illness? How about now you have an opportunity to go into recovery? How about coming with us? You know what I mean? How long? Have I gone too far? Yeah, I think 15. What? I think 15. So I got more time? Yeah. All right. All right, let's see what the book says here. Um, when dealing with, all right, it says here, Tell him exactly what happened to you. So he may become interested in why you're, you're looking pretty damn healthy, standing at the foot of the hospital bed there, or you're sharing in meetings and it sounds like you've really got your life together. You know, what the hell is going on? Tell him exactly what happened to you. Stress the spiritual feature freely. If the man be agnostic or atheist, make it emphatic that he does not have to agree with your conception of God. The first thing this guy said was, I don't really buy the, the AA God thing. And you know what I said to him? I don't either. <laughs> because I know what he's talking about. He's talking about a religious, dogmatic conception of a Trinitarian God that, you know, the, 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 the nuns, like, bashed him over the head for when he was two. That's not what I believe in either. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, so I basically said, look, forget the word God. How about power? How about the word power? How about you're powerless? You don't have the power to fix your life. You don't have the power to put all the pieces back together. You don't have the power to hitch up your bootstraps or you would have done so by now. You're not a stupid person. How about we come to believe that there's a power and maybe the power wraps around AA. Maybe there's the power in the meetings. Maybe there's the power in the sponsor. Maybe there's the power in the steps. But when we all do this together, we seem to get in touch with this power. We seem to gain access with this power. You willing to come along for that ride? Absolutely. The main thing is that he'd be willing to believe in a power greater than himself and that he live by spiritual principles. Uh, let's see what else we got going on here. So, another thing that we're supposed to do with these individuals, and this could be the first visit, this could be the second visit. I have not done this with this individual. It's probably going to be when I actually meet with him after he's well. But it says this, outline the program of action, explaining how you made a self-appraisal, how you did a four-step, how you straightened out your past, how you actually went out and paid the money back and straightened out the past by doing the ninth step, and why you're now endeavoring to be helpful to him, the 12th step. It's important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in your own recovery. My, my sponsor, my first sponsor told me this. I was so appreciative that he was taking me to meetings and talking to me and answering the phone. You know, I mean, I, I thought I was such a, a low life. And here's this guy with a house, you know. Uh, and, uh, and he looked at me, he goes like, Chris, stop. You're, you're never going to have to pay me back. You know, what I do, I do as a service. I do as a gift. What you're going to need to do is you're going to need to do what I'm doing with you. You're going to need to do that with somebody else. That, that's how you pay me back, by paying somebody else. Um, make it plain that he's under no obligation. You only hope that he will try to help other alcoholics when he ex escapes his own difficulties. Suggest how important it is to, to, that he place the welfare of other people ahead of his own. Now, that's pretty drastic. Other people ahead of their own. The illness alcoholism, really what it is, is it's a deep, toxic manifestation of selfishness. It, that's what alcoholism is. It's a massive, massive, painful 
expression of selfishness. And we get to the point where it's so unbearable being that selfish that we, we drink ourselves to oblivion. And we use drugs and we use whatever we can to get out of right here, right now. Because it's not, sobriety is not tenable. And that's really what, what alcoholism is. So, so an antidote to that selfishness is a selflessness. The, the real antidote is that he, that he start to place the welfare of other people ahead of his own, which is like revolution. I remember when my first sponsor started getting me to do service commitments. Oh, we're going to go over to so-and-so's house uh, to, you know, help him move. I'm like, I don't know so-and-so. What? what? You know, I'm going to help. So I don't even know them. You know, you, you want me to help them move? Like carry furniture? Like on a Saturday? It was unheard of to me. And, and you know... What he was, he was about service. You're going you're gonna to help at the picnic for the treatment center. Treatment center is having its annual picnic, and you're going to cook. I'm going to cook. For who? Who am I going to cook for? I don't know these people. You know, it was, it was my, my whole perception of reality had to be shifted because I would never do anything for anybody Unless there was something in it for me, it just wasn't part. It wasn't part of part of my operational system. So, so what happens is, is we develop a capacity to be compassionate. We develop a capacity to uh, to to have a service ethic and, and a volunteer ethic, and and we spend a lot of time. The people I know who've gone through these steps and have, have experienced the spiritual awakening, they spend a lot of time helping other people. <laughs> Not necessarily just in AA, you know, uh, in their community, uh, in their family, in their neighborhood, in their church. They, it's almost organic. You know, when you've done these steps and all of a sudden you're now finding that many hours of the day are being taken up by things that are helpful to other people. It's, it's, it's like the opposite of active alcoholism. Um, make it clear that he's not under any pressure, that he needn't see you again if he doesn't want to. You should not be offended if he wants to call it up. So it really is a take it or leave it. What, what we do is we tell him what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And hopefully we get them engaged in some identification. And then it's, I'm available. You know, you can, you can come with us if you want. It's take it or leave it. We're, we're, we never put the handcuffs on him and drag him in here. You, you know that doesn't that doesn't work. But if we've done if we've done a good if your talk has been sane, quiet, and full of human understanding, you've perhaps made a friend. You have you have, you have disturbed him about the question of his alcoholism, and that's all to the good. So you've disturbed him. You've told him what powerlessness is. You've told him what the obsession of the mind is. You've told him how much trouble he's in, and that this is a progressive illness. And he's not going to be able to get out of it on his own. You, if you've told him that, you've disturbed him about his alcoholism. And he may not be ready right now. I've had a lot of people that I've had this talk with that have called me up later. You know, it's, sometimes it's God time and it's their time. Your candidate may give reasons why you need not follow all the program. He may rebel at the thought of a drastic house cleaning, which requires discussion with other people. He may balk at pay, pay the money back. Uh, don't contradict such views. Tell him you once felt as he does, but you doubt whether you would have made much progress had you not taken action. Uh, on your first visit, tell him about the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. If he shows interest, lend him your copy of this book. The amazing thing is, is that this book, when it was first published, cost 
I don't know, six dollars. I forget how much it cost. But if you look at how much the book cost in 1939, and you put it in 2020 money, this, this book cost about as much as a college textbook costs now, like $85 or something. So when you were lending them your copy of the book, that, you were going to get that book back. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So, um, so lend them your copy of the book. Let them read through. Here's, a, here's another thing that I feel very, very strongly in. We're supposed to be the people saying, are you willing to go to any lengths? We're supposed to be getting that commitment from people. Are you willing to go to any lengths? A lot of times we don't offer them the dignity of understanding what any lengths is. And they don't offer us the dignity of being truthful because they're just going to say yes if we ask them that. You know what I mean? So how about we offer them the dignity of this is what any lengths is going to look like up to page 88 or whatever of the read up to page 80 in this book. That's what I'm going to be asking you to commit to. That's what any links is. And, uh, and sometimes when I'm sponsoring somebody, I, I get calls from all over and, uh, and sometimes I'll sponsor somebody I've never met. I sponsor people in, in Australia and, and Scandinavia and, I'm never going to get to see them, probably. So I've got some exercises that I give them that I don't necessarily have to do if you're sitting in front of me with a book. And one of the exercises is if you ask me to sponsor you, I'm going to ask you to read the first 164 pages, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. One of them is, is this work what you want to do? do? I mean, do you want to do this? You, you know, the first 164 pages, do you want to do this? Are you willing to do this? And I'll usually get a, a commitment from them. And some of the other questions are, why do you want to do it with me? Uh, you know, uh, where have you been dishonest about the step process up to this point in time? And, and I'll ask some of these questions. I've got some different exercises that I've learned from the people that I've, I've worked with. But... Um, If he's not interested in, in your solution, if he expects you to act only as a banker for his financial difficulties, a nurse for his sprees, or a coach for his drama, you may have to drop him until he changes his mind. This he may do after he gets hurt some more. So, so again, in the early days of AA, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong or indifferent, in the early days of AA, they, they had you well into the step process before they brought you to a meeting. I mean, you, you had to be, you had to really mean business. And what, what meaning business was, was you were going to, you were going to engage in this work. And, um, and then you were brought into the fellowship. So today, today we have the opportunity to come into the fellowship long before we're exposed to the recovery program in many cases. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us if we, if we really are, are doing our job in AA is to seek out the people who need this. Uh, seek out the people who are in real trouble. Seek out the people who are really powerless. You can tell because they're relapsing, okay? You know, seek them out and... Uh, and try to engage him in this. If you've never done this before, if you've never taken somebody through the steps before, don't be afraid to do it. Just open a book and just, just start reading. And, and when it says to do something, do it. They made this thing so simple that people s s detoxing could do it. You know, that it, we have complicated it. There's an economy in this, in this process. There really is. So... So I didn't do much reading, Steve. Sorry about that. That's fine. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's what I came here and was guided to say. Great. Thank you. My name is Chris, and I'm an alcoholic. Amen. It's good to be here uh, again. I, I, I love this group. I like Princeton a lot, too. I always try to get down here early just to wander around 
uh, Main Street over there. Uh, so last week, last week I shared, you know, basically on uh, the first half of the chapter, working with others. Uh, I shared what what my experience with that chapter was. I, sh- I shared some examples on how I've I've applied it in my life. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'm, I'm going to step back a minute, and I want to I want to talk about some stuff that I think is very very important for current Alcoholics Anonymous for uh, for people to uh, for people to understand. Um, there's there's an incredible power in fellowship in one drunk. Um, Work one drunk connecting with another drunk or a group of drunks for the purpose of staying sober. Alcoholics Anonymous isn't the first organization to have done that. In uh, the late 1800s, the, in the mid 1800s, it was the Washingtonians, but, but toward the end of the 1800s, there was a bunch of groups of people who, who, in a, in a common effort, spent time with each other and made commitments to each other to stay sober. And there was a lot of success with these different organizations. Um, the problem was, was when the bond or the fellowship activity um, would trail off or the group would dissolve or people would move. For the most part, uh, the people would get drunk. The the Washingtonians went from 300,000 people in, I think it was 1865 to, by the time it was 1868, they'd all, they were all gone and they were all drunk. Um, There was a, there was a, a Keeley League. Um, there was this individual who, he was a scam artist. There's a million scam artists out there that want to take your money and treat your alcoholism, you know. There's some good people too, but there's always been scam artists and there always will be. And, and this guy comes up with this cure and, and he called it the gold cure. So what it was was, in the very beginning, he would inject you with gold dust. Now, he found that it near killed the people that he did it with. You can imagine that that's not, you know, a very healthy, uh, you know, a, a, a healthy thing to do. But he changed it around. He messed with the chemicals a little bit. And he called it the Keeley Cure. Four times a day, you, you, you would inject yourself with this. And it's supposed to be a cure for, cure for alcoholism. Well... Uh, he builds over a hundred treatment centers. This is the late 1800s. He builds over a hundred treatment centers where you stand in line to get your shots four times a day. And uh, a lot of alcoholics and a lot of drunks are getting sober. Now, it had nothing to do with what was being shot in their arm. It had to do with they put all these people in one building for one particular reason, and that's let's all stay sober. So through the course of history, when we get together and we commit to each other that we're going to, you know, we're going to do something about our drinking, a lot of times we're very, very successful, as long as those connections are maintained. Now, um, when I showed up in Alcoholics Anonymous, I nobody nobody told me this, but the impression I got was meetings were the treatment for alcoholism. That's what I that's that's what I thought. Now, again, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that meetings are bad. I, I, Everything, everything begins with the fellowship. Everything wraps around the fellowship. It really does for, for most of us. 
But I believe that meetings were the solution to alcoholism. And if I went to meetings, I would recover from alcoholism. And, um, and that, that couldn't be further from the truth. What, um, what happens with consistent meeting attendance, for most of us, a lot of people are way too sick for it to work, but for most of us, we'll stay sober. If we go to a meeting every day, we do our 90 and 90, we get a home group, you know, we, we pick four or five meetings a week and we go to them religiously, we'll probably be okay and we'll probably be sober. That's not what Alcoholics Anonymous was about. It's what it's become in some areas, but it's not what Alcoholics Anonymous is is about. Um, I read this last week. It comes from a little pamphlet that Bill Bill wrote. I think he, I think it, it's called uh, Problems Other Than Alcohol, and I, I think he wrote he wrote it in 1958. Okay. And it says in here, sobriety, freedom from alcohol through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps is the sole purpose of an AA group. Um, and he, had, he really understood where the solution was. Can we, can we come in and, and be fellowship maniacs and stay sober and not go back to jail and get our job back and, you know, uh, put our family back together and all that stuff. Absolutely. But, but the solution for alcoholism is it's, it's a larger, it's a larger endeavor than just going to meetings. What, what it's going to entail is uh, uh, it's going to entail a revolutionary personality change. It's going to involve a different way of seeing and viewing the world, a different way of reacting to situations that uh, when we get lifed, different ways to react to that. And this comes about through the practice of specific spiritual exercises. And they call it in Alcoholics Anonymous, a spiritual awakening. So think about that. Spiritually, we will awaken. What is that? So... As, as the result of the 12 steps, we're going to spiritually awaken. So what does that mean for our spirit if we're just going to meetings and we haven't done any steps? Spiritually, we're going to still be asleep. And we need to be awake. We need to be awake to be recovered. We need to be able to see things as they really are. We need to be honest with ourselves and other people. Especially we need to be honest with ourselves. And through this awakened spirit, we, we gain access to that, that realm of intuition. To really know, to really know what's, what's, what's going on. I want to read something here before we get started on what I'm supposed to read. Um, 178. I want to read something from Tradition 9. Now, we've all known relapsers in Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Um, when I was first coming around, this is 8990, what would happen in most of the groups that I was in was if somebody would relapse over and over and over again, I would hear people talking about that individual like this. Well, he just, he just doesn't want it enough. Or he's just, you know, he, he, he wants to drink more than he wants to stay sober. 51% of them wants to drink and only 49% of them wants to stay sober. Or he's not being honest. He's not being honest with himself. You know, well, any number of things. What, 
what would happen was they would pin those relapses on the individual. It was the individual. If he'd just pull up his bootstraps and, and do what we do, you know, he would stay sober. And, and, it, and it's sad, but that was happening in a lot of groups uh, back, back then. And the fact of the matter is, is, is there's a scale there's a scale with alcoholism, and there's a scale with drug addiction, if there's any, you know, crack tweakers in here. Uh, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a scale in any kind of obsessive, compulsive, or addictive disorder. And what the scale is, it's not how much you used or how much trouble you got in, or how much money you spent on it, or how, you know, that's not the barometer that's not the scale what the scale is is how much lack of choice have you lost over whether you use it again or how much you use when you use it that's the barometer what's your what's your lack of choice so a lot of times people who are in real trouble end up being the relapsers and in some of the groups that I was in, people maybe didn't go down the scale that far. They found that, you know, just coming to some meetings, they're able to get, stay sober, have some coffee, you know, put their life back together. Everything's kind of cool. The more trouble you're in, though, the less that's going to work because you've lost power, you've lost choice, you've, you've lost control. Now, the book Alcoholics Anonymous Fortunately, it was written for low, what they called low-bottom, real, hopeless alcoholics. Those are the kind of people who drink on the way home from the treatment center. You've probably seen or know people like that. They've lost all power of choice and control. They drink no matter what. You know, they're those people. And a lot of times they're coming to us for help. They're coming into these rooms, sensing there's something here, sensing there's something here, but there's not enough power for them. There's not enough power for them because they're just trying to use the meetings as a defense against the first drink. So what the early AAs learned is they learned that not drinking is not a defense against alcoholism. Going to meetings is not a defense against, against relapse or alcoholism. The answer is in the awakening of one's spirit through the practice of these steps that they had incorporated from the Oxford group. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to read this little, this is page 174, so this is Tradition 9, almost at the end. It says, unless each AA member follows to the best of their ability our suggested 12 steps to recovery, they almost certainly sign their own death warrant. So this is Bill writing, and I guess it was... 1948 or something, he was putting these, these essays together that ended up in this book. In 1958, he's saying the sole purpose of an AA group is the teaching and practice of the 12 steps. He understood how important they are to the alcoholic. And then I like this part. So, so, you're, so if you're not doing the steps, Bill thinks you're signing your own death warrant. He's not saying come in and do a 90 and 90. He's not saying come in and get a coffee commitment. He's saying if you do not, to the best of your ability, and there's a lot of latitude in there because no one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to this stuff. But if you're not really trying with these steps, you're not supposed to stay sober. So... So I'm back in these early meetings in 1989 and 1990, and people are drinking, and I'm realizing today that they weren't drinking because they weren't 
they weren't engaging in any of the recovery process, which is the 12 steps. They weren't doing the 12 steps. So it says here, their drunkenness and disillusion are not penalties inflicted by people in authority. They result from their personal disobedience to spiritual principles. I think that's a very powerful sentence. We relapse because of our personal disobedience to spiritual principles. Alcoholism is a very unorthodox illness. Uh, it's an Ill- I believe it's an illness. Some people will say it's a disease. I'm not going to argue that. I just I don't say that myself uh, because there's too many people who want to prove that it's not. But nobody is saying that it's not an illness. If you're, if you're drinking yourself to death, you're ill, and there's no one who's going to debate that. So it's an illness. Now, almost any other illness in the world, you go to professionals who, who give you medicine. They'll, they'll give you an operation. They'll put you on a diet. They'll do something. For your recovery, if you're not hopeless, they'll, they'll tell you what you need to do for your recovery. And, and you know what? You do it. If you go in and a doctor says, you know, you got stage three cancer, but, you know, if you do A, B, C, and D, there's a 50-50 chance you're going to survive. You'll sell your house and your family and whatever. quit your job. You'll do whatever you need to do to do A, B, and C. There's a sense of urgency, you're locked in, you want to survive, you're mission-driven. With the illness alcoholism, there's a reluctance to recover. There, there's a delusion that it's not really that bad. There's a dishonesty that we have about our own facing this problem from a spiritual point of view. So we need the help of the fellowship, but we need the help of the fellowship the right way. So I'm going to start reading where I'm supposed to on page 95, about halfway down. <laughs> if, you're, if he's not interested in your solution, okay, you're, you're in front of a, a they call them prospects if you're pitching them. They call them protégés if they've started to work with you. And then they call them friends after they've gone through the steps and you're both on an equal footing. You know, you're on a peer level. The, this, this, the, the, the sponsorship that's, that's come up today where, you know, you got to call your sponsor every day for 35 years and tell him what, you know, he's going to tell you what color car you're going to drive and all that stuff. That stuff is cultish and it's ridiculous. I'm a big book guy. I make no apologies for, for making that judgment. But what it says in here, what it says in here is, is if you're in front of an alcoholic, what I read last week was you tell him your story, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. And there's instructions in how to do this. There's, it gives you multiple instructions in how to do this pitch, which is basic. basically it's, dude, I know exactly where you are. You know, I, I got to tell you, you know, 10 years ago, that's right where I was. And you, start, and you start telling the person some stories. I did a 12-step call last week in the hospital. That's what I did with this guy. I told him about my drinking. And I got him interested. And I got him talking. And by the time we were done, he wanted to know where the meetings were. You know. Now, that's not always the way it is. But, uh, but anyway, it's, so, so you're in the middle of this pitch. And it says here, if he's not interested in your, in your solution, if he expects you to act only as a banker for his financial difficulties, a nurse for his sprees, a coach for his drama, if he wants you to raise him up, 
you may have to drop him until he changes his mind. This he may do after he gets hurt some more. Now, understood that you understand that you have explained what alcoholism is, and you've explained what the solution to alcoholism is. You've explained how you went through the 12 steps. If the person doesn't want to bother, it gives you it gives you the instruction in here. You're not supposed to bug them. You're not supposed to beg them. You're not supposed to threaten them. You're supposed to drop them. And when I'm when I'm working with sponsees, trust me, folks. A lot of people ask me to sponsor them. Um, I'm no better a sponsor than anybody in this room. And and they, but they don't know that, you know. But. But what will happen is I'll give a talk somewhere and then somebody will come up and say, oh, Chris, would you sponsor me? You know, and, and I'll go, OK, fine. You know, here's what here's what it's going to look like. First thing I want you to do is read the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll give them some exercises to underline some stuff. Right. And then I'll say then we're going to meet and, you know, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about step one and what sponsorship with me is going to look like. And then I'll do that. And, you know, I'll get them to agree that they're willing to go to any lengths. But I've asked them to read the big book so they're, they're going to know what any lengths looks like. So I'm, you got to be willing to go to any lengths. And what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm not going to ask you to be a GSR. I'm not going to ask you to do all this... I'm going to ask you to go through these steps. You know, do you understand that? And a, and a lot of times, a lot of times people will disappear. They'll see that as an overreaction to a problem that they might actually have more under control than they thought yesterday. And, 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 and that's, that's fine. But, but this is what the book Alcoholics Anonymous is telling me to do. If someone is not willing to go through the steps with me, what am I going to offer them? Am I going to help them try to manage a life that we've both agreed is unmanageable? And, and how do I know what you should do? What, why am I a better judge of, you know, your life than you are? You know, we, we, we're, we all fall short in word, thought, and deed. I'm not going to I'm not going to pretend to help navigate somebody through, through all their work problems and their marriage problems and their family problems. That, that's not what I'm really supposed to do. I'm, I can share my experience if I have similar experience. But what I'm really good at and what I'm qualified for and what the book is telling me is my responsibility is if someone is willing to sit down and go through these steps and and lay the kit of spiritual tools at their feet, encourage them and show them how to apply these steps, how to take these steps, how to how to do the prayers, how to write the inventory, how to make the amends. That I'm qualified for. If he's sincerely interested and wants to see you again, ask him to read this book in the interval. Uh, after doing that, he must decide for himself whether he wants to go on. So, they got to read the book. If they can read, sometimes you got to help them read. But this is what we do. The book says what we do. You know, you've read the book. Are you are you are you ready? You know, this is the course. This is a textbook. This is the course that you're gonna you're going to take. He should not be pushed or prodded by you, his wife, or his friends. If he's to find God, the desire must come from within. If he thinks he can do the job in some other way or prefers some other spiritual approach, encourage him to follow his own conscience. Again, you know, we, we do not have the only way. We don't have the only way to a spiritual experience. We, you know, we don't have a lock on recovery from alcoholism or drug addiction or anything. But I will tell you what we do have. We have a program of action. And we don't have two 
programs of action. We've got one program of action, the 12 steps. We don't have another program if, if this is too much for you. We've got the one. So if they're willing to go through this program, we can really help. I've got to tell you, anybody in here who's taken somebody through the steps and they've done these steps know exactly what I'm talking about. You see the lights come back on. You see recovery happen. It's absolutely amazing. Now, if you've never taken the steps or you've never taken somebody through the steps, you've got no experience on that. And you may have an opinion on it, but it's an opinion only. It's, it's, it's not informed at all. If you want an informed uh, experience or opinion, go through these steps, take somebody through these steps. Um, we merely have an approach that worked with us. So, do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Um, this is another mistake I made early on in AA. Uh, you know, I grabbed somebody and I didn't let go. If somebody made the mistake of asking me to sponsor them or help them or whatever, you know, I'd go, I, I'd go, I'd go almost to, I'd, I'd work harder than they were working on their recovery. You, you know what I mean? And, uh, and again, If your prospect does not respond at once, search out somebody else. If your prospect is not willing to go through the steps, move on to somebody who is. It's telling us to do that. You are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. We find it a waste of time to keep chasing a man who cannot or will not work with you, who cannot or will not go through the steps with you, they're saying here. If you leave some, such a person alone, he may soon become convinced that he cannot recover him by himself. To spend too much time on any one situation is to deny another alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. Now, don't hear me say this because I'm not saying this. Everyone is welcome in the fellowship of AA. You are so much allowed to sit in the back row and languish with untreated alcoholism, not being held accountable to working a recovery program. You're, you're as much entitled to that as I'm entitled to come in here and recover. What I'm talking about is my personal 12-step time with you. That, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not going to waste time. I'll shake your hand. I'll clap for you when you get your 90 days seven times. I'll do all that. But my personal time, I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow the outline in, in this book. So they now start talking about the second visit. Suppose you're making your second visit to a man. He's read this volume and says he's prepared to go through with the 12 steps of program of recovery. Having had the experience yourself, you can give a much practical advice. So what do you need to be able to do a 12-step, a real 12-step job? You need, to have, you need the experience of actually going through the steps. You need to have paid the money back. You need to be praying and meditate. Uh, let him know you are available if he wishes to make a decision and to tell his story. But do not desist, uh, insist upon it if he prefers to consult someone else. So if he wishes to make a decision, what is that? That's the third step. They took the third step on their knees. They were very serious about this, this third step decision. And to tell his story, that's a, that's a fifth step. Uh, there's a whole bunch of... Uh, Instructions in here, if he's, he can be broke or homeless, you might help him about getting a job. I've done that. Um, uh, you might want to lend him money. I, 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 I've done that. I don't do that too much anymore. Uh, you may invite him into your house. I've done that. I try not to do that too much anymore if I don't have to. Uh, but I've done all this stuff. Uh, you, you, it says here, use your discretion. Be certain he will be welcomed by your family. Make sure he's not trying to impose upon you for money, connections, or shelter. 
uh, permit that and you only harm him. You will be making it possible for him to be insincere. You may be aiding in his destruction rather than in his recovery. A very early warning, uh, 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 a very early warning shot for enablers, you know, the, the, the codependents. Never avoid these responsibilities. Um, you have to be the good Samaritan every day if need be. It may mean the loss of many nights sleep, greater interference with your ple- pleasures, interruptions to your businesses. Remember, these guys, they went on more 12-step calls than they went to meetings when this book was written, okay? They went on more 12-step calls than they went to meetings because there was the meeting in New York and there was the meeting in Akron. And Monday night, they'd have their meeting and they'd talk about all the people that they're working with or trying to work with or going to go try to find. That'd be Monday night. Tuesday night, a bunch of them would go out to Greystone Hospital. A bunch of them would go to court. A bunch of them would go down to the Bowery. A bunch of them would hit the bars or the hospitals. And they would try to find people to work with. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, same thing. The weekend would come and they they would a lot of times have house parties where all the people that are working the steps get together in somebody's house and spend the weekend together doing fist steps and, you know, fellowshipping. And Monday, the meeting... The, the AA meeting and then back out on the street. They were doing their 12-step work on the street. We don't necessarily have to hit the street every single night anymore. We know where the still sick and suffering alcoholics are the, for the most part. They're in the discussion meetings. You know, that's where they are. Uh, they're in the treatment centers. They're in the detoxes. They're they're, they're, you know, we know where to find them if we want to find them. And uh, for many years, for well over 20 years, I had, uh, I had commit. I don't right now. I probably should get one. But I, I had, uh, I had commitments at the VA hospital. I had commitments in treatment centers. I had commitments in IOPs. I had commitments at Robert Wood Johnson. You know, I went all over the place uh, finding uh, finding alcoholics to to basically do what I can do to carry the message to them. And no one was helped more than me. Um, Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trust in God and clean house. It gives a bunch of instructions in here about how to handle the family and what's going to go on with that. It gives some warnings. It gives us some warnings about what we shouldn't do. Um, and then it, basic, then it basically gives us gives a really nice marching order here. It says, both you and the new man must, must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. So not just the new man, but you. We need to, we need to constantly be working on uh, the maintenance of our spiritual con- condition. And it says, if you persist, remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things that came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. What a promise is that? So what that promise is saying is when we start living this spiritual life and we start to try to help other people, we're placing ourselves in God's hands. And God will give us things that are better than anything we could have come up with before we even started this work. That's a hell of a promise. And and it's a promise that's come true to me. Follow the dictates of a higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world no matter what your present circumstances. And then there's a a bunch of really crazy promises here. Assuming we are spiritually fit. Okay, spiritual fitness means we've gone through the 12 steps and we're working, we're taking other people through the 12 steps. That's what the book would consider spiritually fit. 
And if we're doing that, we can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. Uh, people have said that we must not go where liquor is served. We, we must not have it in our homes. We must shush, shun friends who drink. We must avoid motion, moving pictures which show drinking scenes. We must not go into bars. Our friends must hide their bottles if we go to their house. We mustn't think or be reminded about alcohol at all. Our experience shows this is not necessarily so. So he starts to talk about the, the huge shift in perception that really is what recovery is. We meet these conditions every day. An alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind and there's something the matter with their spiritual status. So if you have a problem going into a bar, if you have a problem at a, at a fish concert because you smell pot, if you, have, if you can't go to when your, ha- your family is having Christmas and some of your family members drink and you can't handle it, that's fine. Get out of there. But understand, you got spiritual work to do. you got step work to do. Because we can be safe and protected from that stuff. We can be all right with that. Uh, so our rule is not to avoid a place where there's drinking if we have a legitimate reason for being there. That includes bars, nightclubs, dances, receptions, weddings, even plain, ordinary drinking parties. It's telling us if we've got a good reason, we're going to be fine. If our motives are good and we've done the steps and we're working with other alcoholics, we're going to be fine. I, I, it's been a long time since I've been at a drinking party. And it's not because I can't go. It's because I don't want some, some guy that's babbling telling me the same story four times in a row, you, you know, leaning on me and close talking at me. Uh, you know, I, I'd had, I had enough of that stuff. I had enough of that stuff uh, back in the day. So... Uh, you know, you will note that we made an important qualification. Ask yourself on each occasion, have I any good social, business, or personal reason for going? Or am I expecting to steal a little vicarious pleasure from the atmosphere of such places? If, the, if you can answer these questions satisfactorily, you need have no apprehension. Go or stay, whatever seems best. But be sure you're on solid spiritual ground before you start and that your motive is and going is thoroughly good. Uh, while, we, while you were drinking, you were withdrawing from life little by little. Now you're getting back into the social life of this world. And I cannot tell you how true that is for me. My drinking, in the last two or three years of my drinking, I had a terrible job that I hated every minute being at. And the second I got off of that job, I was at the liquor store and back at my house, pouring myself ginormous bourbons and Cokes or screwdrivers. And, and just getting to oblivion as fast as I can. And do not bother me. Don't send me mail. Don't call me up. Don't knock on the door. I'm not interested in any of your crap. I'm busy. And, 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 you know, I'm drinking. And, uh, and I had isolated myself from my family, from friends, from high school people. I, you know, by the time I came out of this alcoholic haze, I was like 33 years old and like with no short-term memory. You know, my, my short-term memory was gone for about five years. I couldn't remember people's names. And... And, you know, getting back into Alcoholics Anonymous, that was my first step back into the world, back into society, back into community and communion with. It was my first experience um, uh, in a long, long time with crowds of people. And alcoholism is it's an illness of isolation the things that get in the way of our abusive drinking have to go and those are usually people or places or things you know what i mean they have to go uh they're in the way so so now we're starting to come back out 
of our cave and we're starting to come back into the world. Um, I believe so much today that the root of my alcoholism is my selfishness and my self-centeredness and how that's manifested, manifested. Various forms of self, manifestations of self have corrupted my worldview and my attitude and my outlook. And, and I, I believe that as human beings, we're, we're tribal and there's also something in us that drives us to communion with, uh, community with. Uh, and and being isolated from all that is very, very painful. And a lot of times I drank in a very lonely way because I was lonely. So I, I was treating my loneliness with isolation. Do you, you, you understand? And that's really what alcoholism had come down to for me. Um, I believe the community with and the connection with, uh, uh, you know, getting back in touch with all of you and with establishing healthy relationships, practicing these spiritual principles in all my affairs, that's what keeps me in a fit spiritual condition. That's what keeps me safe and protected from relapsing. And that's also what what puts me in the sunlight of the spirit where God can give me things that are much better than anything I could have designed on my own. And the fact that for the last 30 years, I've always been working with other people, I don't think anybody's been helped by that more than me. And, uh, and every single time I go through this, this book, every single time I, uh, I place my experience next to the information in this book, it becomes more and more profound to me. It becomes more and more of a, a remarkable solution to, to an illness, uh, alcoholism. And, uh, I think that's I think that's all I got tonight. Thank you.